Welcome to On Your Own Terms. I'm Patty Talbot, and this is the place we learn together what it takes to change the world on our own terms and in our own special ways. Today, I'm so excited to invite you to meet Joy Borman. Joy is another amazing woman that I met like several others that you've been introduced to here in the One of Many community. One of Many is an organization that works on women's leadership and empowerment founded by Dr. Joanna Martin. Joy and I met there in a coaching training program that we were involved in for almost a year online before we met in person in Stratford-upon-Avon in the United Kingdom. Now, before I ever even met Joy in person, in person, I was impressed because I was hearing the kinds of questions and concerns she was raising and the kinds of questions she was asking from across the room. Like me, she seemed to be a little bit uneasy when it came to talking about money (laughs) and starting a business because also like me, she'd spent quite a lot of time being really interested in development and equality and how to raise people up. And like many of us that consider ourselves servant leaders, the idea of charging for our services, although it's important, is often difficult to talk about. So I was very interested in Joy because of that. But as I've gotten to know her better, you're going to see more and more reasons that Patty Talbot needs to be learning things from Joy Borman because she spent many, many more years and months in different countries in Africa doing development work. And my work in Malawi was just a small, once a year, month long kind of program. And as you've heard, if you've been following my show at all, I had my struggles with learning how to be culturally competent and effective in that environment. Well, joy hit the ground running when it came to that, and cultural competence just seems to be in her very nature. So I want to introduce you to Joy today to learn about what she's doing with women's empowerment and her coaching work, and also to learn the background that has given her the skills and the perspectives she needs, as well as the training that she's attain through one of many women to be an amazing women's leadership and empowerment coach. You'll want to tune in now to hear Joy's homegrown solutions for a patchwork world. This is Joy Borman. from the UK. I was raised in a seaside town in Somerset by two teachers who never intended to have children and had done a decent amount of travel before having kids. So they went on VSO, which is Volunteer Services Overseas, a little bit like Peace Corps. And they went to Fiji as teachers. And I think that was something of the wallpaper of how I was brought up. They were there for several years. So when they brought me up, they brought me up with a kind of, I think my mum was a little bit of a rebel. My name's Joy. And I think that's because my mum quite fancied herself as a bit of a hippie. And she didn't want to do everything that everybody else did. And one of the memories that I have, particularly that I think sort of feeds into my life, is a memory where we're on the beach because I grew up in Somerset and there's a lot of beaches. And my mum is quite a large lady. She is a large lady. And she was wearing a yellow bikini. And she said to me as my teenage self, do you mind being on the beach with me in my bikini? And I thought this was a really peculiar question. And I said, no, not at all, mum. And she said, good, because I think it's more fun to be wearing a bikini Then doing what people say that I ought to do when I'm the size I am, which is to sit up on a bench on the cliff and watch everybody else having fun. But I would rather wear my bikini and be surfing and having fun with you. And I thought, if that's the rules, I'm not sure I like the rules, these social rules that have come about. So I had a mum like that and my teaching parents sent me to a further away school than the very local school. So we got our house and then we got our driveway and then there was the school right there, the very local school. And I didn't go there. It would have been convenient, but I didn't go there. And the reason I didn't go there is my parents had taught in this school. They taught in all the schools in the area and they had a preferred school. Now I've since found out there was more because my brother was very intelligent and I'm just gifted in my own way, darling. 
But for my brother, who was very intelligent, my parents thought would have a hard time at the local school. So we're away. So we're about 90 minutes on the bus in one direction, 90 minutes on the bus in the other direction. And when I was walking around my hometown, the local girls would go, I smell snob, which is an English word for you think you're a bit better than us because I'm in my uniform. Remember, we distinguish ourselves with our uniforms and it was a posher uniform. And again, there was a moment there where I realized that there was an expectation of belonging or fisting in that didn't come absolutely necessary. With the, the backgrounds of my parents and the Fiji and the slightly different rules that my parents seemed to go by, I did feel like a bit of an oddball through quite a lot of growing up. And then I went to drama school because I was very good at directing and performing. So I went to a drama school in London. And I studied theatre anthropology, which was how does theatre affect culture and how does culture affect theatre, which I found fascinating. In fact, I found it so fascinating that I stopped doing it and went to Kenya. And I lived up the side of Mount Kenya with a, a friend of mine. And together we worked in a drama group with some local youth. And we did some dramas about HIV and about what they called life skills, which was a lot about assertive nurse and managing your own self. And I was observing how women would come out for church in Kenya and they'd come out for the theater. They'd come out for the sort of social gatherings like this. And it was the women who on the walks home would have really transformational conversations. It was like you could give them a text and then they would work out what happens next as they were walking home. This real power in using storytelling and drama and the art to change cultures. So I go on. After my year in Kenya, I start studying theatre for development. So using theatre with street kids or in Africa or to do with wells and water and education that goes along with it and how you could pull people out. And so it was like health stuff and also the education of it. I studied that and then started working, advising on how to use drama in taboo subjects in East and Southern Africa. So it was a lot to do with gender, stigma reduction, sexual health, child health. There were some quite unpleasant things to do with FGM and abuse and abduction and some um, practices that were very damaging to children. And so we would use drama and I would train the local people to use their local language to use drama as a tool for educating people where the community could rise up and respond uh, with this is what we're going to do we're not putting up with this anymore this is the way we have to to work on it and through doing this I realized that actually there were some things that as an outsider I got to do because I was an outsider I got to ask the questions why would it be this way what options have you got for example, with the teenage girls in Kenya, when we were talking about FGM, they, was, they would say, en masse, they would say, it's too late for us. But by the time we're grandmothers, we can do something about it. When we're the matriarchs, we can do something about it. Now, this is going back 20 years or so now, and things have changed. But at the time, it was quite taboo to talk about that because at the time, it was very much about being concerned about globalization and monoculture and respecting different cultural practices. There's now, of course, it's called child abuse, just out and out child abuse. But at the time, it wasn't like that. Another thing that came about in these kind of conversations was the education that was coming from the West was to do with, for women and girls, just say no. So abstinence, just say no. And then as I got to know people much more closely, the girls would talk to me and they would say, Joy, what can I do? Because my parents don't have the money to send me to school. However, if I sleep with the administrator, I've got a chance of getting into school. So what should I do? I thought, oh gosh, it's not as simple as just say no, give the message about just say no. 
And then also similarly, when I saw women being pushed around and then we talk about boundaries and we'd say, you need to say no to this. He may be your boss, but you need to say no. Or he may be your uncle, but you need to say no. And it wasn't always about sexual stuff. It could be about work stuff as well. And then they would say to me, but I it's because it's culture. I, have to. I don't have authority to say no, to make choices over my body. I started to become aware that actually it's a lot more complicated than what you can think from the outside. You think, oh gosh, if you just tell people how to be, then they can be it. But actually, it's the insides that really make a difference to what comes out. I am living in Tanzania at this point. Strange things happen when you live in different countries. I'm sure there's a lot of the audience that have lived in different countries. And at this point, I am running a um, campsite with a Swahili school on it. Um, and I am receiving the change makers, the NGO workers, the missionaries. They're coming to be residential at our campsite as the the place to learn about how to learn the language, but also how to be like, what's rude, what's not rude, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what do people believe, what do they say and how should you say it? So the cultural acclimation as well. So I'm managing a campsite with my husband and we are seeing how people are coming in fresh from outside of the country absolutely full of wonderful intentions with a real gusto but uh, needing a little bit of help and a little bit of support about how to be change makers in a way that is going to sustain or that's not just going to blow up in people's faces how to learn to have a sort of a uh, receptive way of being whilst also being themselves and responding to the calling that they're feeling about why they should be there and how to be there one of the, the projects that I did during this time was helping a grandmother who had been working. She was with USAID and she had been a spouse of an accountant who had spent something like 25 years going around different places on different placements. And she was about to retire home. And she felt a real strong sense that she needed to hand over some of the knowledge that she had been cultivating about for her it was about what the bible says about sex and she had gotten a real pickle with herself about how to do that because she really didn't want to write a book it wasn't something that she wanted to do and I thought do you know what I'm a really good second person someone to bounce the ideas around and to hear and say okay we've talked about this why don't you write or prepare this before I come back next week because I'd written some training and it's much easier to have somebody to hold you to account and keep you on track. So this is what I did with this lady. And we decided not to write a book. She didn't want to. What she uh, felt that she could do from her place of authenticity is to make a radio show. So we made a radio show for religious people talking about the holy book. So in Tanzania, it's about 50% Christian, 50% Muslim, and almost total silence when it comes to sexual relationships in the places of religion. So again, I'm used to working with taboo. So I encouraged Nancy to put together this radio show, which had 12 weeks as part of it and a text service. And what we realized is that if it was playing on the radio, women could listen to it and it wouldn't make them dirty. Because if you went out and bought the newspaper or subscribed to something, it's quite active. Whereas to get this message out it needs to be quite passive so I didn't put it on love but it's just on I'm by the fire I'm cooking but I can hear this thing and this is interesting so that's what we did and we decided that we also needed for people who wanted to know a little bit more we needed a way for them to be able to ask their question so that was one of the projects that I did before uh, I had baby number one out there and then baby number two we were back in the UK It's an interesting point in my story in terms of how I felt being a person of significance and impact and then coming back and being pretty much invisible. Nobody knew my superpowers. (laughs) Nobody called out to me along the road. 
nobody saw that I had any gifting or anything other than who they thought I was. Lovely ladies. They would say, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a stay-at-home mum. And they go, oh, how lovely. And I wanted to push them over because it wasn't really me. I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do, but it wasn't really truly me. With two small children, I shot them out because I didn't think I was going to like parenting very much. I thought, just get them out as quick as possible. So there's 15 months between them. And I'm a stay-at-home mum and I am bored, but I'm doing the right thing, what I thought was the right thing. And then you just need to fast forward several years of me doing the right thing and just almost slowly eroding as a person in terms of confidence, in terms of experience of life. I was really deeply outside of my flow, being at home and not connecting with people, not encouraging change and getting messages out. And this is, I think, the preamble to why I do the work that I do now. My own personal belief is that everybody is created purposefully and uniquely and that there's like a blueprint that every human has, which is their spot. It's the moment that they're really in flow and that ease comes for them and power and authority comes and in a really beautiful way, not that sort of dominion over kind of power, but just a really beautiful way of being. And that's what I'm really happy to help people find for themselves now. And I think that people learn it by being told that you can't wear a bikini on the beach. You get told stuff. You get told that you don't fit in because you're too posh. You get told that this is the way it always is for all people. Therefore, you have to do it this way. And so for me now, what I love to do is to help people come back to their own selves as they really feel it without all that conditioning and help them find that sweet spot. My belief is that women have had uh, a bit of a rough ride when it comes to power, that we have only recently been able to enter the workplace. When we have entered the workplace in the past, it has been almost like a man, and if not like a man, then a better man than a man, that we've had to achieve a little bit higher. Very independently strong women, quite cut and dried and thrust, Whereas if we can find the actual natural sweet spot in us, there's a more authentic kind of feminine power that we have. And in my coaching, I talk about power types where there's the warrior, there's the lover, there's the mother who's caring and compassionate. There's the queen who knows what's good for people in her realm and how to put in order and structure. And then there's what I call the source of which is the connection with the divine, the connection with there's more than just what we can see. Things happen for a reason and in some other way. So there's these different power types where we can have an impact on people around us just by turning up in a different way. I think all of us turn up in these different ways, but we're just not very aware of it. And as we get to choose the impacts that we have on people around us, we start to find our sweet spot way of becoming influential, having impact. And it's much easier. It's much easier than being this sort of dominion over kind of woman. It's much easier. With the international work, I was able to ask questions because I was an outsider. Now, when you're looking at your own life, it's very difficult to see your way of being because it's the paradigm you're in. You can't see the way you are. I think all the years overseas, which was in East Africa and also working um, in Azerbaijan as well in a refugee camp, I learned to not make any assumption at all about anything, but instead to empower other people to bring up what is important to them. And I think given the chance and given the, the power and the authority and given the voice, then people will and what they are able to bring is really significant. Now, remembering about the blueprint, that what they were created for, tapping into that, helping people find that inner wisdom, that small voice, whatever it is that is in them, 
can no longer deny it, but to bring it out is where people are able to really have a big impact. And so never making assumptions, asking the question, really deeply listening to what people are saying, listening to what people think is impossible, and then questioning, is it really impossible? Or it, have you just been told it's impossible? Have you been told that those are the rules that we all have to live by? And that's just the way it is. Now, when I came back to the UK, I was aware of the cultural difference between Africa and the UK. And one of the things that I really missed was the slow friendship. So as a woman, you would spend a lot of time peeling onions and garlics and chopping and stirring and tending the fire and sitting. And people would come from out of town and they say, oh, can we stay the night? And you say yes. And then they would stay for a week. And so you'd have a really deep kind of connection with people just in the slowness. Whereas in the UK, and I think it's probably true for the States as well, that there's a quick quickness about it, that people come around and say, sorry, I'm late. And then you have a quick moment where you do the headlines and then you clear off. And what I felt like I wanted to do when I came back to the UK is to find those places that were like the fireside places where people could just gently be together, just slowly be, whether that is fireside or whether it is just chopping the vegetables together or whether it is uh, making bread or doing crafts together or just a way of being together that was a slow way. There's no pressure. You can say something, you'd stop facilitated. It's just a way of being together. And in that way, you can start to call out what you can see in terms of the blueprints that people have. And it comes from their passions. and It comes from the things that they want or don't want. You can start to pull it out. So in terms of what I do now, I am a women's coach and I've been able to pull out those blueprints from people. And it's been wonderful to see. There's been different people that I've coached. So there's somebody who's very successful in work, quite ahead of her game, but had a real almost fear of failing. And so she used that as an excuse to not really try or not really find a way to make capacity for other things. So she was pressing on up to 60 and she was using her work as an excuse to say that she's too busy for a relationship. Actually, underneath it, she was too frightened to put herself out in a relationship. And yet, through the course of coaching together, she was able to have a relationship. When we started together, she only did knitting and watched TV. And she, I just got an email from her. I don't coach her anymore because we, we completed. But I've got an email saying that she's doing an ad sale. And then I've got an, another lady who was already living her life in the way that she in, had intended she had already put her head above the power pit something that she loved but because she had driven that project forward she felt vulnerable when it wasn't working out for everyone in her family and she became very concerned about her, the health of her daughter and through working with the power types she was able to recognize that she had actually for her own self some ideas about success and about how you must drive or to success. And then she abandoned that concept, really, that belief, and tapped into the mother power type and the sorceress power type. And from that place of just compassion and care, her daughter started thriving. And it stopped being such a problem for her because she realized that she was just a very small piece, the support that she was having. It wasn't just all on her. And so now we're doing a retreat together when she's helping other people, menopausal women with uh, difficult teenagers and tweenagers to come together and support and hear each other. There is another lady who also is very much top of the game, incredibly talented, but terrified that she, all of this is going to be taken away from her. The externals was all working absolutely fine, but internally she was exhausted and was doing that thing of spinning all the plates and keep them going. Just nothing can drop. Nothing can be let go of because everybody will see that I wasn't able to do this. 
So she made all the externals happen in a really beautiful way, but actually internally, totally exhausted, quite fearful of getting found out. And she has just done a massive launch in her business. And she said she just coasted in, used all the power types and what everybody else was like, firefighting. She's like, we've got this. Things went wrong. She handled it. She had a wonderful time the weekend before with her small kids. She went paddle boarding on the ocean. She had a wonderful relaxing time. And she was like, I am achieving so much more now from this place of calm and replenished than I was trying to frantically get it all done. But that is the work that I'm trying to do now. So that mothers, daughters, children, homes, communities, people on the PTA, people that are walking down the streets have so much more generosity to give without that constant worry. Because of having their voices stepping into their power, men and women would be more able to make their unique difference in life. Women are no longer used to being invalidated, their voices being squashed or feeling that they have to overperform in order to maintain the level. Relationships are more peaceful. That inner voice that sort of uh, driving inner voice is more settled, that people are refreshed and filled and living from a place of contentment and calm and living in their genius. And that would have an impact on everyone around them. I would love for people to be able to invest in their leaders so that they are not burning it, so that they're able to have the impact and the clarity and serenity to have that impact from a place of fullness, rather than a place of being scattered and trying really hard. I would like to invite people to do is have a look at the smilingcoach.net, that's the website, where you will be able to get in contact with me You'll be able to do your power type profile. You'll be able to make a call with me to see if I can help you in any way. And I offer a couple of packages to do one-on-one -on -one coaching to help you find your sweet spot, to help you see your own paradigm and help you release the stuff that's making you frightened and tired, even if you don't see it now, so that you can be contented, replenished and living in your genius. Thank you, Joy. I know that people here have been inspired by your story. And like me, I'm sure that they can see that you embody all of these characteristics and attributes that change makers have in common. But today I want to focus specifically on the connecting quadrant. Do you see how Joy's work has developed the cultural competency kind of skills, the kind of skills that all of us need if we're going to be working across diverse populations to start first with considering our own language, our own approach, our own cultural biases? And if we have something to share and something to teach, what's the best avenue for delivering that message? in a way that will be welcome, but also in a way that can even be heard in the way that she did with her radio show during her early work on the continent of Africa. Can you see how Joy's work has for years been making an impact on equity for women and girls and on education in sometimes touchy situations? Can you see how empowerment and freedom and autonomy over our bodies as women gives us the potential for raising our voices to impact all the rest of those sustainable development goals? That's our work here at Blue Roads Education, accessing our skills and attributes as changemakers in the service of those goals on our own terms. Next week, I will introduce you to another changemaking woman. And in the meantime, May you be grounded in your beingness, guided in your doingness, generous, inclusive, and culturally competent in your connectedness, and inspired in your reflectiveness, 
so you can consciously change the world on your own terms. I'm Patty Talbot. I'm always learning, and I know you are too. Mm-hmm.